So in this video I'm going to introduce a very important function which is called the complex exponential so e to the z. How can we define this for the case that z is a complex number? Okay. So the simplest case of this is just where z is purely imaginary so how can we define something like e to the i times some number let's call it x okay so it's not so straightforward to see this because you know for example if x is just if this is just a real number suppose that you've got something like e squared then it's obvious how to define this right this is e times e so that's no problem right if you want to define something like e to the half that's also no problem because it's the solution of the equation e to the half squared is equal to e and so on so you can define e to any real number just by taking the value of the number e which remember is 2.718 blah 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 and then um, doing these operations, calculating the square root, squaring, and higher powers, and so on. But for an imaginary number here, you can't define it in this way. You can't define it as any, um, you know, square root or squared or anything of this number e. So you have to define it another way. And the way it is usually defined is as the Taylor series. So we've seen that for real x, e to the x is equal to its own Taylor series, right? The Taylor series of e to the x converges everywhere. So e to the x is equal to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6, blah, 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 which is the sum n goes from 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. So this was not the definition for real numbers, this is just a result we derived using calculus. But for complex numbers, where this is a complex or an imaginary number, this is the definition. This is how we define e to a complex power. Okay. So for complex numbers, we define e to the i x is equal to 1 plus i x plus i x squared over 2 plus i x cubed over 6 and so on which is equal to the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of i x to the power n divided by m factorial okay so we, we define it as this so you have to work out exactly what this number is, right? It's going to have a real part and an imaginary part. And for example, the real part 1 is real. This is imaginary. Then ix squared, this is just minus x squared. So again, this term is real. This term is imaginary. Um, the next term is going to be ix to the power 4, which is just equal to x to the 4. This is again real. So it turns out that in this sum, the even powers, 0, 2, 4, 6, and so on, correspond to the real part of the number. And the odd powers, 1, 3, 5, and so on, correspond to the imaginary part of the power. Uh, sorry, the imaginary part of the number here. Okay, so let's work that out in a bit more detail. So we need to compute ix to the power n. So this is i to the n times x to the n. But what is i to the n? we just do a quick little table, n and i to the n, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, so i to the power 0 is 1, okay, because anything to the power 0 is 1, i to the power 1 is i, i squared, we've seen that by definition is minus 1, then i cubed is minus 1 times i, so that's minus i, i to the 4 is i times minus i, um, which is minus i squared, but i squared is minus 1, so this is just plus 1. Okay, so we've got to write that down. So this is minus i times i, which is minus i squared, 
which is minus minus 1, which is 1, right? That's the way you work it out. And then again, i to the 5 is 1 times i, which again is i. So you see here, if I just extend it, it repeats in a cycle of 4. It goes 1i minus 1 minus i, 1i minus 1 minus i. So every 4, it repeats. Okay, and as you can see, as I claimed, the even n correspond to the real parts, and they have a plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 pattern. And then the odd n correspond to the imaginary parts, and they have a plus i minus i plus i minus i pattern. Okay, so we can take these results here and put them into the series for e to the ix and see what we get. Right, so I'll separate it now into real and imaginary parts. Okay, so the real parts is the first term is 1, then the next term is with minus, so I get minus x squared over 2 factorial. And the next term is going to be the 4, which comes with a plus, so it's plus x to the 4 over 4 factorial. The next term is 6, which comes with a minus, minus x to the 6 over 6 factorial, and so on. And the imaginary part is this one, so that's x. And this one, i cubed, is minus i, so I get from here minus x cubed over 3 factorial. And the next one's going to be the power 5. i to the 5 is just i, so that gives me plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. Okay, the next one is 7 i to the 7 is minus i, so I'm going to get minus x to the 7 over 7 factorial, and so on. And hopefully these series should look familiar to you, right? This is just the Taylor series of cos x, and this is just the Taylor series of sin x. Okay, so the conclusion of this definition of e to the ix, so the x complex exponential, is that e to the ix is equal to cos x plus i sin x. Okay, and this is a very important result, and it's known as Euler's formula, or Euler's equation. <coughs> and it relates the complex exponential to the cos and sine functions for real x here. Okay. Now there's a few nice things we can do with this formula. Um, so one of them, perhaps the most important, is the exponential form. Okay. So any complex number z has is made up of two real numbers a and b right the real part and the imaginary part and therefore it's possible to plot it on a two dimensional um, space like this so i can define two axes like this and i say that this way i tell you what is the real part a this way I tell you what is the imaginary part B. Okay. So then any point here, any point say any point up here, I can say this is the point A plus B times I represented on my diagram here. Okay. So this kind of representation representation of complex numbers uh, in the two-dimensional real plane is known as an Argand diagram. But you know, may know that if you have a point in two dimensions, as you do here, a plus bi, you can define it using Cartesian coordinates. That means go a this way and then go b that way. Right? But you can also define it using polar coordinates. In other words, you can define this number as have length r and be at angle theta. Okay? So a and b 
and r and theta have the same information. Okay, so here r and theta are polar coordinates. R and theta. Okay, but there's clearly a relationship between r and theta and a and b, and it's very simple trigonometry to work out what that is. So this length here is a, and this height here is b. So you get that a is equal to r cos theta, and b is equal to r sine theta. But then the complex number z, which is a plus bi by definition, this is equal to r cos theta plus r sine theta times i, but this is r times cos theta plus i sine theta. And you see that this is exactly what you have in Euler's formula for theta, right? So therefore this is equal to r e to the i theta. Okay. So this gives you another way of, of writing down a complex number. Instead of writing it down in a plus b i form, which is like Cartesian, so go a this way and b this way, you can write it down in this form, r times e to the i theta, where r is the the length of this line here, it's called the modulus of the complex number, and theta is the angle here. Okay. Right, so I'll do some examples of this and then I'll define some useful terms. So, um, examples of exponential form then. Okay, suppose I have a complex number 1 plus root 3i. Okay, so I choose this because it turns out to be nice in the exponential form. Okay, so where is this complex number on the argon diagram? So the real part is 1, so that's here. And the imaginary part is square root of 3, so that's going to be somewhere up here. Okay, like that. Okay, so we need to find out what is r and theta for this number. So r is simply, by Pythagoras, theorem it's the square root of this squared plus this squared, so it's the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared, okay, which is the square root of 1 plus 3, which is 2. Okay, So I choose this example because it comes out nice. So r is equal to 2, and what's theta? Theta is then, well okay, let's see, so we've got a triangle. This length here is 1, this length here is root 3, We've worked out that this length here is 2. So therefore, I can write theta as the arc cosine of this divided by that. Sorry, the other way around, this divided by that. So it's arc cos of a half. OK, and in the previous class, I told you you should know this. Arc cos of a half is 60 degrees, or in radians, pi by 3. OK. Incidentally, when you're doing complex numbers, you must use radians for the cos and sine functions. Why? Because when we derived Euler's formula, we did it using the Taylor series for sine and cos. But the Taylor series for sine and cos rely on the fact that the derivative of sine x is cos x, and the derivative of cos x is minus sine x. And, as I have mentioned several times already, that is only true if x is measured in radians. So only if x is measured in radians is this formula true. And therefore here where we calculate the value of theta, we must use radians. Okay. Right, so then, that completes this example. So therefore what we've shown is that the complex number 1 plus 3 square root 3i can also be written as 2 times e to the i theta. Okay, so the, the general form is r e to the i theta, right? That's the exponential form, and in this case r is 2 and theta is pi by 3. So you can write the number in that form. So that's one example. Um, okay, I think that's enough. So I'll, I'll maybe do another example in, in the, the examples video later on. 
Right, so a couple of uses of exponential form. Exponential form is very useful for calculating the powers of complex numbers. No, it's okay. So the first thing, exponential form. is useful for calculating powers. Okay, why is that true? Because you, well, you can see it. If you imagine a plus bi to the power n, then to calculate this you have to multiply a plus bi together n times. It's quite a lot of work, right? But if you can convert this into complex exponential form like this, r times e to the i to the n, then you can just multiply, so r to the n, that's a real number, so that's quite easy to compute, and then this is e to the i n theta. Okay, this is quite a nice geometrical interpretation as well, if we look at it on the argon diagram. If I take a number, say here, which has length r and angle theta, this is z, and I square it, so n is 2 in this formula, then the length here is squared, and the angle is multiplied by 2. So if this is the complex number z, then the complex number z squared will look something like this, where this length here is r squared, and this length here, this angle here, sorry, is 2 theta. And again, if you do r cubed, then, so if you do z cubed, then This gives you r cubed, and this gives you 3 theta. So the angle becomes increased by the same amount again. So, okay, so it's going to be too long to draw on this <laughs> diagram, but it's going to be somewhere up here. z cubed, which has the length r cubed, and the angle here is going to be 3 theta. So that gives you a nice geometrical interpretation of powers of complex numbers too, which follows from the exponential form here. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say for this video. So in the final video, we're going to look at some more difficult functions. We'll probably end this part out because... <laughs>